You are a fluke. You are a separate event. And you run from the maternity ward to the crematorium and that's it, baby. That's it. Now, why does anybody think that way? There's no reason to, because it isn't even scientific. It's just a myth. And it's invented by people who wanted to feel a certain way. They want to play a certain game. See, the game of God got, got embarrassing. The, the idea of God as the potter, the architect of the universe, is, is, is good. And it makes you feel that life is, after all, important. There is someone who cares. It has meaning. It has sense. And you are valuable in the eyes of the Father. But after a while, it gets embarrassing. When you realize that everything you do is being watched by God. He knows your tiniest, inmost feelings and thoughts. And you say after a while, quit bugging me. <laughs> I don't want you around. So you become an atheist. Just to get rid of it. And then, then you feel terrible after that because you got rid of God. But that means you got rid of yourself. You're just nothing but a machine. And your idea that you're a machine is just a machine too. But however, you see, this whole idea that the universe is just nothing at all but unintelligent force playing around, not even enjoying it, is a put-down theory of the world. People who had a, an advantage to make a game to play by putting it down and making out that because they put the world down, they were a superior kind of people. So, uh, that just won't do. Uh, we've had it. Because if, if you seriously go along with this idea of the world, you're what is technically called alienated. You feel hostile to the world. You feel Listen. that the world is a trap. It is a, a mechanism. It's electronic and neurological. Mechanisms into which you somehow got caught. And you, poor thing, have to put up with being in a body that's falling apart and uh, that gets cancer, that gets uh, uh, the great Siberian itch, and uh, it's just terrible. And these mechanics doctors are trying to help you out, but they really can't succeed in the end. And you're just going to fall apart, and it's a grim business, and it's too bad. So if you think that that's the way things are, you may as well commit suicide right now. <laughs> Why go on? And you only go on if the game is worth the candle. Now the universe has been going on for an incredible long time. And so really, a, a satisfactory theory of the universe has to be one that's worth betting on. That's a very, it seems to me, absolutely elementary common sense. If you make a theory of the universe which isn't worth betting on, up. why bother? So you see, all I'm trying to say is that the basic common sense about the nature of the world that is influencing most people in the United I States today, to. the fully automatic model, is, is simply a myth. If you want to say that the idea of God the Father with his white beard on the golden throne is a myth, in the bad sense of the word myth, so is this other one. It's just as phony and has just as little to support it as being the true state of affairs. Why? And let's get this straight. If there is any such thing at all as intelligence and love, beauty in the wind well you found it in other people in, the air. in other words it exists in us in as human light. beings and as I said if it is there in us, us it is symptomatic of the scheme of things we are as symptomatic of the scheme of things as the apples are symptomatic of the apple tree or the rose of the rose bush
The earth is not a big rock infested with living organisms any more than your skeleton is bones infested with cells. The earth is geological, yes, but this geological entity grows people and our existence on the earth is a symptom of the solar system and its balances as much as the solar system in turn is a symptom of our galaxy and our galaxy in its turn is a symptom of the whole company of galaxies goodness only knows what that's it but you see when as a scientist you describe the behavior of a living organism you try to say what a person does. It's the only way in which you can describe what a person is. Describe what they do. Then you find out that in making this description, you cannot confine yourself to what happens inside the skin. In other words, you can't talk about a person walking unless you start describing the floor. Because when I walk, I don't just dangle my legs in empty space. I move in relationship to a room and so in order to describe what I'm doing when I'm walking I have to describe the room I have to describe the territory so in, in, in the describing my talking at the moment I can't describe this just as a thing in itself because I'm talking to you and so what I'm doing at the moment is not completely described unless your being here is described also so if that is necessary, if in other words, in order to describe my behavior, I have to describe your behavior and the behavior of the environment, it means that we've really got one system of behavior. That what I am involves what you are. I don't know who I am unless I know who you are. And you don't know who you are unless you know who I am was a wise rabbi once said if I am I because you are you and you are you because I am I then I am not I and you are not you in other words we are not separate we define each other we're all backs and fronts to each other you know uh, you can't for example have two sticks you lean two sticks against each other and they stand up because they support each other take one away and the other falls they interdepend and so in exactly that way, we and our environment and all of us and each other are interdependent systems. We know who we are in terms of other people. We all lock together. And this is again and again the serious scientific description of how things happen. And any good scientist knows Therefore, that what you call the external world is as much you as your own body. Your skin doesn't separate you from the world, it's a bridge through which the external world flows into you and you flow into it. Just, for example, as a whirlpool in water, you could say because you have a skin, you have a definite shape, you have a definite form, all right? Here is a, a flow of water and it suddenly it does a whirlpool and then it goes on the whirlpool is a definite form but no water stays put in it the whirlpool is something the stream is doing and exactly the same way the whole universe is doing each one of us and I see you today and I recognize you tomorrow just as I would recognize a whirlpool in a stream I'd say, oh yes, I've seen that whirlpool before. It's just near so-and-so's house on the edge of the river, and it's always there. So in the same way, when I meet you tomorrow, I recognize you, you're the same whirlpool you were yesterday. But you're moving. The whole world is moving through you. All the cosmic rays, all the food you're eating, the stream of steaks and milk and uh, eggs and uh, uh, everything is just flowing right through you. When you're wiggling the same way, the world is wiggling, the stream is wiggling you. But the problem is, you see, we haven't been taught to feel that way. 
The myths underlying our culture and underlying our common sense have not taught us to feel identical with the universe, but only parts of it, only in it, only confronting it, aliens. And we are, I think, quite urgently in need of coming to feel that we are the eternal universe, each one of us. Otherwise, we're going to go out of our heads. We're going to commit suicide, collectively, with courtesy of H-bombs. And, uh, all right, supposing we do, well, that will be that, and it will be life making experiments on other galaxies. Maybe they'll find a better game. <laughs>